In the world of investing, we keep looking for an edge. Everyone wants to be smarter and faster. I often say I'm probably more patient than most. My guest today might know of a secret edge worth sharing. My guest today is Carl Honoré. You write that speed is not always the best. And you mention in your book, in Praise of Slowness, it's the fittest that survive, not the fastest. I really had to pause and think about it. It seems to me that we are locked in a world obsessed with speed. So in every corner of our lives, from you know the workplace, because it's not just in the boardroom or on the trading floor or in the office that we get stuck into this faster is better ethos. It's it's at home with our children, right? You know, we're we're reading one minute bedtime stories or wolfing down dinner as if we're <laughs> on a deadline. Well, we're not on a deadline, right? And this takes a terrible toll on every aspect of our lives. It harms our health and our diet. For quite a number of years, I've been flying the flag for slow and not in an extremist way, right? I mean, I'm not a fundamentalist of slowness. I love speed, right? <laughs> Faster is often better. We we all know that, but not always. And that's really the key to unlocking this whole, what people call the slow movement or the slow revolution. It's about choosing the right speed for the moment. So whether you're at work, at home, playing sports, cooking, walk, whatever you're doing, you try to find the right pace, speed, rhythm for that moment. What musicians call the tempo giusto. And if you come to each moment thinking, how am I going to make the most of this moment? How am, I do, how am I going to do this thing as well as possible instead of as fast as possible? That is a game changer with a capital G, right? That is just going to take everything you do up several notches. Welcome to Talking Billions. We talk about big ideas, big inspirations, big topics. We take on the hardest subject of all, money. How to make it, save it, keep it. But our conversations lead us to an even bigger question. What it means to live a rich life beyond money. My guests share their practices, principles, and evergreen wisdom. I'm your host, Bogumil Baranowski, author, TEDx speaker, investor, and a founding partner of Seacard Associates, a boutique investment firm founded in New York City. Join me on this quest to unearth the wisdom of the ages. My guest today is Carl Honoré. Carl is an award-winning writer, broadcaster, and TED speaker. He's the voice of the global slow movement. The media called him an in-demand spokesman on slowness, the global guru on the slow movement, the unofficial godfather of a growing cultural shift towards slowing down, a verbal magician conjuring concepts with no new idea too complex to capture. His two main stage TED Talks have racked up millions of views. Carl travels the world to deliver powerful keynotes that put time and tempo in a whole new light. His counterintuitive message is simple but game-changing. To thrive in the fast world, you have to slow down. Carl's first book, In Praise of Slow, chronicles the global trend toward putting on the brakes in everything from work to food to parenting. Carl's second book, Under Pressure, explores how to raise and educate children in a fast world and was hailed by Time as a gospel of the slow parenting movement. Carl's third book, The Slow Fix, explores how to tackle complex problems in every walk of life, from health and relationships to business and politics, without falling for superficial short-term quick fixes. Carl's latest book, Boulder, Making the Most of Your Long Lives, explores aging, how we can do it better and feel better about doing it. It's a spirited manifesto against ageism. Carl recently published his first children's book, It's the Journey, Not the Destination. Published in 35 languages, his books have landed on bestseller lists in many countries. Carl is a father of two and lives in London. While researching his first book on slowness, he was slapped with a speeding ticket. Today, we talk about the following ideas. Speed is not always the best. It's the fittest that survive, not the fastest. The biggest challenge to the slow movement is the alleged price, the sacrifice we need to pay if we dare to slow down. Carl shares his perspective. Boredom is a modern invention, a contradiction and contrast of sorts. How can we both praise speed and slowness in our lives? How do we strike a balance between the two? Being time rich and being time poor. 
how to become time rich in this ever faster world we live in. The curiosity in slowness is growing also in the industry that is speeding us up, the tech industry. We touch on remote work and how it's challenging the work, life and speed dynamic. Leisure is much more than escape from work demographics and aging and Carl's other book Boulder and please stay tuned until the end where we talk about how we can get started on this path to slowness and how kids are growing up under lots of pressure. On my podcast we discuss money and investing but we end up talking about time as our most precious asset. My guest has a lot to share on the topic. Please help me welcome Carl Honoré. Hello, dear listener. I have a new book out. It's a soft launch, and you are among the first to know about it. It's called Crisis Investing. It's a collection of 100 essays, 500 pages, that I wrote to our clients during the global COVID pandemic. I share our lessons from managing family fortunes through one of the most difficult periods in recent history. It's an intimate look behind the scenes, with a retrospective commentary that I added after. The economic and financial backdrop might feel unique to that time. But you'll see that the investment principles shared are timeless. The book includes kind words from Guy Speer, the author of The Education of a Value Investor, William Green, the author of Richer, Wiser, Happier, Lauren Templeton, the author of Investing the Templeton Way, Christopher Mayer, the author of 100 Beggars, Gotham Bate, the author of The Joys of Compounding, James E. Hughes, the author of Complete Family Wealth, Brett Barrett, who's a co-founder and host of the Choose a Fi podcast, and John Seforek, the author of The Wealthy Gardener, Lessons on Prosperity Between Father and Son. If you're enjoying the show, I think you'll enjoy the book. Head over to Amazon, look it up, Crisis Investing, Bogumil Baranowski, and enjoy a discounted price for both Kindle and paperback. Please review it, rate it, share it. Your support means the world to me. And now, on with the show. Well, hello, Carl. Nice to see you. How are you? Thank you. It's great to be with you. I'm well, thanks. Wonderful. Well, you know that I love your book, and we spoke briefly before, and I'm happy to see you again and have this opportunity to ask you some questions and go deeper on the topic of slowing down, slowness, being slow. In the world we live in, and in, in my profession, in investing, everybody praises the speed. We want to do things fast, and technology allows us to do things really fast. But your book gave me ideas, inspiration, and I want to say permission to slow down. So I have a list of questions for you, and let's just get started. You write that speed is not always the best, and you mention in your book, in Praise of Slowness, it's the fittest that survive, not the fastest. I really had to pause and think about it. Tell me more. It seems to me that we are locked in a world obsessed with speed. The culture tells us from every angle that faster is better. It's woven into our vernacular. You think of, you know, the early bird catches the worm, you snooze, you lose, all these expressions telling us that if we slow down for just a second, we are roadkill, right? So yeah. we, we all grow up in this culture, all marinated in the idea that slow is lazy, slow is boring, slow is stupid, slow is unproductive. And we, we I mean, we are social creatures. We're infected by the cult of speed and the virus of hurry. So in every corner of our lives from you know, the workplace, because it's not just in the boardroom or on the trading floor or in the office that we get stuck into this faster is better ethos. It's, it's at home with our children, right? You know, we're, we're reading one minute bedtime stories or wolfing down dinner as if we're <laughs> on a deadline, but we're not on a deadline, right? We're just kind of living in deadline mode. And this takes a terrible toll on every aspect of our lives. It harms our health and our diet, destroys our relationships and families and communities. And then just spooling back to the workplace makes it difficult for us to think, to innovate, to come to difficult decisions, to see the big picture, to connect the dots, to do all the stuff that we need to do at work, right? We don't do it as well when we're stuck in roadrunner mode. So I guess now for quite a number of years, I've been flying the flag for slow and not in an extremist way, right? I mean, I'm not a fundamentalist of slowness. I love speed, right? <laughs> Faster is often better. We, we all know that, but not always. And that's really the key to unlocking this whole, what people call the slow movement or the slow revolution. It's about choosing the right speed for the moment. So whether you're at work, at home, playing sports, cooking, walk, whatever you're doing, you try to find the right pace, speed, rhythm for that moment, what musicians call the tempo giusto. And if you come to each moment thinking, how am I going to make the most of this moment? How am I, do, how am I going to do this thing as well as possible? instead of as fast as possible, that is 
a game changer with a capital G, right? That is just going to take everything you do up several notches. I love it. Well, I have to start from the beginning. I'm really curious how you got started on this path. Why this particular topic? I'm curious if there was a tipping point, a personal moment or a story where you thought, I really have to start paying attention to this. There definitely was for me. I've, I've realized now that I've written four books, <laughs> that every one of them starts with a personal existential crisis or some kind of deeply intimate wake-up call. And that was very much the case with my book, um, In Praise of Slow, or In Praise of Slowness, as it's called in the United States. And, and the wake-up call was this. I, I found myself speed reading bedtime stories to my son, which is just an awful thing to be doing. Is it? <laughs> right? you know, my version of Snow White was so fast that it only had three dwarves in it. You know, it was just awful. And, and my, my son would always catch me. He knew the stories inside out. He said, you know, what happened to Grumpy? Why are there only three dwarves? It was just horrendous. And then I caught myself flirting with buying a book I'd heard about called The One Minute Bedtime Story. So Snow White in 60 Seconds. And I thought, hallelujah, right? Great idea. I need that book now from Amazon drone delivery. But then, you know, the second wave of thought came over me and it was like a light bulb over the head moment. I suddenly thought, whoa, what are you doing here? You know, are you really, are you really in such a hurry that you're prepared to fob off your little boy with a sound bite instead of a story? At the end of the day, it was just horrendous, right? It was like an out-of-body experience. And I just thought, I've lost my way. I've lost my mind here. I need to slow down. And that was when I hit rock bottom. And I, I think people break rock bottom with speedaholism in lots of different ways. For me, it was that terrible realization that I was accelerating bedtime stories with my son. For other people, it's health, right? The body one day just says, that's it, mate. You know, you can't take the pace anymore and you have a burnout or you can't get out of bed one morning. So there's lots of different flags or warning signals people get, but they always point in the same direction, which is that you're living too fast. You're racing through life instead of actually living it. I love it. So the world we live in and, you know, just growing up and collecting all those stories that you mentioned, there is a big challenge, maybe a bit of fear mongering that if you slow down, there's a price to be paid. You'll fall behind. You won't get promoted. You will not get the opportunities that you would if you're, you're joining the, the race and going fast. It's really hard to really dare to slow down. Can you talk about that mm -hmm. aspect? There's no question. In a world that venerates speed, slowing down is an act of rebellion. Mm -hmm. You're challenging the status quo. You're breaking from the pack. And that's a terrifying thing for social animals like human beings. But that doesn't mean that it's impossible, right? Difficult is not the same as impossible. I think, especially in the last 10 years or so, for various different reasons, it's become more and more plain and apparent to more and more of us that there's too much speed in the system, that we are going too fast too often, and that we need to relearn the lost art of slowness. We need to slow down sometimes. And so the more evidence that mounts up that too much speed is hurting us, both individually and collectively, it, the easier it becomes. And the more people who do slow down and find themselves winning the race, like the tortoise beating the hare, more and more examples of those in the workplace and sports or wherever, people saying, you know what, I slowed down here, here and there, and it allowed me to hit a home run. It allowed me actually to speed up better, right? That's the what I call the delicious paradox of slow, is that when you get the right balance between fast and slow, if you take those moments to slow down when you really need to slow down, when it comes time to speed up, you can go even faster and you go faster better because you have awareness, you're alert, you're alive to the moment because of those slow those slow intervals. So it's, it's really about the, the magic of, of changing gears. There's a great quote from The Economist magazine, right, that came out a little while ago. The Economist did a big survey looking at pace in the modern workplace, crunched all the numbers, went through all the data and investigations and s surveys, and came to a conclusion that is, in fact, a perfect summary of this slow creed that I'm proposing to people. The final line of The Economist survey was, or the final paragraph was, forget frantic acceleration. Mastering the clock of business is about choosing when to be fast, which of course is it we all know, right? When to be fast, but also when to be slow, right? When mm -hmm. to be fast, when to be slow, when to be on and when to be off. <laughs> when to lean in, always being told to lean in, yeah? When to lean in, but then sometimes when to lean back. And that's really when the music and the magic happen is when you get that dance down pat, right? You're, you're moving between on and off, fast and slow. You're playing with the right rhythms, the right speed, the right cadence of the moment. That's when everything lights up at work and beyond. And so it, it is difficult at first for people to slow down, partly because of the cultural taboo against slowness. We see it as, as, as a byword I said earlier for lazy and boring and unproductive things no one wants to be associated with. So that makes it hard for us to challenge the, the religion of speed. But the other reason we find it hard to slow down, I think, is just simple chemistry, right? That we are 
so pumped up on adrenaline now. We are so hooked on speed, almost at the cellular biological level, that if you take away the stimulation and distraction from us, and there are a lot of studies that show this, you take it away from us, you slow us down, we don't rejoice and relax, we panic. We, we get thick. <laughs> oh no, I need some more speed. Where is it? Right? We're like a drug addict coming off heroin, right? And no one comes off heroin in a day. You know, it's a process. And I think if you are really hooked on a fast forward lifestyle, if you are totally drenched in speed, distraction, and stimulation, slowing down is going to be a process for you. It's going to take time. It's going to take a few steps forward, one back, step sideways. You know, maybe you've met another step forward. It's going to be a, a journey, right? And of course, that again runs against our quick fix culture because we're all so hopped up on speed. We're all so impatient that we even want to slow down fast, right? So even, even when people get over the cultural taboo and think, okay, a lot of people around me are slowing down. It's working for them. I'm going to do it too. We try to do it fast. So people say, yeah, or people so often it's incredible how often people say to me, oh man, I read your book or I saw your TED talk and I thought, yes, that's for me. I need to slow down. So I signed up for a yoga class. Then I ran across the street to do some meditation. Then I rushed home to cook a slow meal for my family. <laughs> and I ran up. <laughs> just think, wait a minute. That's not, you're not, you're missing something here, right? slowing down is a slow process, but we can yeah. do it. And and the, the, the thing is, there's so many more people are doing it now. And I think the pandemic gave us an extra put in that direction because what was the pandemic, if not a global workshop in slowness? Now, the pandemic was a total nightmare and ordeal for all of us in lots of different ways. But at the same time, I think it brought some silver linings for people. It did give people a chance to taste what a life without FOMO might feel like, you know, fear of missing out, right. a life when there aren't a zillion things to do. And sometimes you just sit down and do nothing, or you just sit down and talk to your partner or go for a walk, just really simple, slow stuff. And people found a real joy and power and majesty and wisdom in that slowness. And so you've seen people coming out of the pandemic, really rethinking and making big changes in their lives, the way they work, where they live, the relationships they're in, how many extracurricular activities their children do. A lot of big seismic changes have come out of the pandemic that I would put under the rubric of slow because the pandemic gave us a taste of slow. And a lot of people thought, you know, this tastes pretty good. I even wrote an article halfway for the pandemic slowing down because I used to commute to an office and then I was working from home. I got back hours and hours of time each day, not commuting. And my day shifted completely. We left New York. We were living in a cabin in the woods for a while. And I realized okay. that... <laughs> And pace of life is changing. Even people said, reading my articles, they said, your articles don't read anymore as if they were written in a big city. And I thought, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Take that as a compliment. Take that as a compliment, I would say. Somehow it, it translates. But I really like the point that you mentioned slowing down fast. We Even that part, we want to do it fast, right? We yeah. want to lose weight in five days. We want to learn a language in two weeks. But we also want to slow down fast. And we go about it the wrong way. But you... Yeah. you you mentioned in the book that you got a speeding ticket when you were promoting the book. Can you talk yeah. about that? <laughs> well, thankfully, it was before I was promoting the book. It was when I was, I was researching it. Oh, researching so it. was it. when I was myself learning how to slow down. So I was, as I was writing and researching the book, I was, I was, you know, it was doctor heal thyself, right? You know, it's the old thing of you teach what you need to learn. And as a naturally fast type, type A person, I kind of wrote in praise of slow to, to work out how to slow myself down, <laughs> really. And as I was researching, yeah, you're absolutely right. I got a speeding ticket, which was really quite extraordinary and, and pretty shaming. I, I wasn't going to mention it in the book, to be honest. I was just going to keep it quiet because I was so ashamed. And then I thought, you know what? I need to put that in there for the very reason that we're unpacking now, because it's a reminder to me and to all of us that slowing down is not easy, right? Mm -hmm. It's not something that you just snap your fingers and tomorrow morning you have the inner calm of the Dalai Lama, right? It doesn't work that way. You know, the Dalai Lama is the way he is after many years of slow and meditation and being a Tibetan monk. The, the rest of us cannot just book it in for next Tuesday. It doesn't, it doesn't work that way. It's, it's a, as I said earlier, it's a process. It takes time. And so I wanted to put that in there just as a sh to show my own frailty and just to underscore to people that, that you will have setbacks. You know, you're going to, you're going to fall back into the old ways. It's like an alcoholic falling off the wagon, right? You know, we're all speedaholics. We slow down. You know, even, even now I'm years deep in this journey towards slow. And I don't, you know, I, I've pretty much cracked it now. I don't feel rushed pretty much at all. I feel like I've, I get loads done. I have a lot of fun. I'm very productive. All the stuff is good. But I, I don't feel rushed now when I used to feel rushed all the time. Even so, there are moments when 
other people's anxiety and adrenaline and patience can start to, I can start to feel a little bit, I can feel myself falling back into the old ways a little bit, especially when I'm driving. It's weird. I think my one real failing on the slow front is probably still driving. I haven't had another speeding ticket since that one, but I've got, I've come close. I tell you, I, there's something about being behind <laughs> wheel on a highway when everybody else is whizzing by at, over the speed. I find it hard to stick the speed limit. <laughs> Just to be honest here, um, I mean, I usually do, but I, I, you know, that's where I struggle. Um, but we all, we're all going to struggle, you know, I, I, unless, you know, unless we become the Dalai Lama and how many people become that. And even that takes time. But I'm really glad you included that story because it made it so relatable. I paused for a minute and I thought, it's also your journey. It's everybody's journey. It's not that you, you know, you read the book or we, you read the five rules or the 10 rules and you immediately know what to do. It's a yeah. journey to embrace it. And I really like that you included it. In... And it's messy. It's messy. And I think it's... that's the key word is messy. Exactly. Because it's it's, sometimes people can hear journey and think, okay, it's A, B, C, D. You go a straight line to A to Z. No. It's not like it's a zigzag. You get lost. You go down rabbit holes. You take dead ends. You get back on the main road. You carry on. It's But that's life, right? That's sort of the glorious, unpredictable, messy thing that is a human life. Um, and I think slowness achieving slow falls into the same metaphorical category. And I also like how you mention other people around us. And it's similar with investing. You know, people make mistakes because they're watching what other people are doing. The fear of missing out in investing is very, mm -hmm. it's a very powerful you know, issue that affects people. And here it's the same. It's not just your journey, but if you're in an environment, we always are, we're social animals. So we interact with other people. And if they're in a rush, I can feel that my body responds to the fact that somebody around me is in a rush, right? And even if I yeah. was not rushing, I start moving faster because I feel like that's the way to do it. And if you're in a big, dense city, eventually that energy is everywhere, you know, catching the train, walking up the stairs, catching the elevator, everybody's in a rush. And eventually you're in a rush and you don't really know why you are in a rush. What I really liked about your book, and you touched on it, is that you found a way to reconcile something that I always considered a contradiction in my life, the slow and fast. So there are things that I really like that are fast. I don't want to take a ship across the ocean to go to Europe. I'm guessing mm. you <laughs> wouldn't want to do that. <laughs> I know people that have done it <laughs> still these days, just for the enjoyment of the journey. But then I want to fly, and I'm, I'm happy that it happens you know, in, in six or eight hours, and I'm on another continent. But then there are moments when I really want to slow down. And I always thought, well, do I have to be the person that loves slowness or do I have to be the person that likes speed? And I think you gave me a permission to divide it in my head and have a big part of my life where I benefit from the speed and I appreciate the mm. speed. And the other half where I really want to slow down. I want to remember this walk. I want to watch the sunset. And you found a beautiful way to reconcile that it kind of gave me a permission. And I think all of us listening and reading that the two can coexist in a happy way in our life. Can you talk about that? I, I thought it yeah, was really eye-opening. I'm glad to hear that that's, because that's sort of what the whole writing of that book did for me as well was, because when I came into the project, I thought, well, does that mean I'm at the end of this going to have to do everything slowly or, you know, no, and it just, no, <laughs> you don't. I mean, no. you know, I mean, I'm a big cook, for instance. And, you know, sometimes if you're making a stir fry, you're going to do that very fast, right? Because you want it to be fresh and have a bit of al dente crunch to it. But yesterday I cooked a lamb neck stew, which on a very low temperature, they're cooked for eight hours, right? And those mm -hmm. are so different. They're completely different meals. They're both luminously delicious. They're great fun to prepare. That one dances at a different rhythm from the other. And that's just the way to think about life, I think, is you just come to each moment. And, and, and I guess we haven't, the word hasn't come up yet, but awareness, I think, is a really key mm -hmm. element here, variable in the equation, is arriving in each moment with a kind of awareness that, that I never had that before, but I have it in spades now, which is I come to moments and I think, okay, just do a little triage. I look at this moment. Is this a moment for speed, for some slowness, for somewhere in between? And just having that little conversation with yourself before you do what it is you're doing mm -hmm. can make all the difference, right? Because so much of what we do is on autopilot. And if it you're is. in a world that's utterly enthralled to speed, your default setting is going to be fast. So you're just going to arrive at every moment without thinking and just get right in there at full speed ahead in turbo mode. However, if you just pause for just a second and think, okay, what's the tempo that this moment is asking of me? That just changes. And then you can make the change. And that, that of course, at first, there may be some withdrawal symptoms. You might find picking slow is a little bit awkward. But you know, with time, you realize that you've enjoyed that meal more. You've enjoyed that journey so much more. You've enjoyed that conversation more because you've had that little second or two of awareness, you've made the right choice on your tempo, your speed, 
then you've gone with it. I like that you said that just because you like slowness doesn't mean you have to do everything slow. And I think that's a big revelation because somebody picking up your book might think, oh, if I like being slow, doesn't mean I have to be slow with everything. And I really like that everybody chooses what they like to do slow, what they like to do fast, but you can do both. It's not either or. I really like that idea. It kind of reconciled two halves of my my world. Where And there's, a, there's another way to think of it as well, which goes a little deeper, which is you can be doing something on the surface fast, so a fast action, mm-hmm. but on the inside, you have a calm, still, controlled, concentrated, slow core, right? So that's what athletes have always called being in the zone. Mm-hmm. That's that moment when an athlete is moving across the field at superhuman speed, doing something that most of us would just regard as you know Marvel superhero level athleticism, right? But they're doing it with a kind of internal calm, right? Their body and mind are in perfect harmony in that moment. They have an internal stillness and inner slow that allows them because what is it? If you think about the great athletes in any sport, so I don't know, uh, I've watched football a lot, you know, and you're, so you think of Lionel Messi or whatever, or in Michael Jordan or LeBron James. The one thing that sets apart great athletes, the superstars from everyone else, is that the superstars are never in a hurry. They're never rushed. They mm. always have time. That's the one thing they, that's their one hard currency that sets them apart from the flock is that they, even when the things are moving at a speed of light around them, they have this, they're like moving through this, the, 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 the hustle and the bustle in this bubble of calm, this bubble of slow and control. They, they just don't seem rushed. They always have enough time. And I think that kind of gets a little bit, that's another metaphor for thinking about slow is that it's not just about the velocity that the thing is happening. It's often the quality of your experience of the moment. It's how you present, how you inhabit the moment, right? So the moment itself might be an activity that's very fast. You could be, you know, uh, in, in the final sprint of a cycling race, or you could be, I don't know, rushing to get a bus, or you could be racing to meet a deadline at work. There are, diff- there are two ways of being in those moments. One is your head is spinning all over the place. You're a headless chicken. You're panicking. You're shooting off in lots of directions. Or you can be in those fast moments of activity with a calm head. You're, like Kipling said, you know, you keep your head while all those around you are losing theirs, right? Keeping <laughs> I your love head. that quote. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think that, that kind of gets it slow as well, that sort of Kipling quote. Um, the idea of when everything is melting down and going crazy around you, you are the eye of the storm, the calm center. It allows you to focus. I'm thinking also a perception of time. And I, just as a quick example, I picked up surfing during COVID. And ah. when uh, you're learning to surf, everything happens so fast and you get up, you fall, it's five seconds and you don't even have the time to think what just happened. But when you get better at it, those 20 seconds on the board feel like a lifetime and you remember what you did with your feet. You remember how the wave looked. Time slows down. And I'm thinking of athletes. I think time slows down in their head for that very moment mm-hmm. when the ball comes or whatever is happening where they pay attention and all those years of practice become handy and time slows down for them. And they come across as very calm and collected as if they've prepared for this very moment for the last 20 years, not the last five seconds. Yeah, which is true. They have prepared for that moment for the last 20 years. Yeah, Jimmy Connors, the famous tennis player, used to talk about getting in that that zone. Right. You can call it flow, you can call it slow, you can call it the zone, whatever it is. And he used to describe how when he'd be He'd watch the tennis ball coming back over the net at, you know, 100 miles an hour, but it seemed to be the size of a beach ball and it was coming <laughs> very, very slowly because he had just, as you say, he had stretched out time. He had mm-hmm. made it longer, more capacious, <laughs> more controllable, right? And he'd done that through that channeling of slow, I would say, that kind of calm, internal calm that you get. You get it in lots of ways. You get it from living a life that has that balance between fast and slow. You you also get the confidence that comes from many long years of training and learning and apprenticeship and, and gathering experience. Again, that's another slow act, right? You don't there's no such thing as an overnight success, right? Um no. it just isn't. We you know, on the outside it looks to us like, wow, this person just came out of his garage yesterday with this fully formed startup. No, usually there's years of of trial and error and and learning along the way. So but uh, yeah. But that's, again, how the media presents it to us. Somebody yeah. ends up on the cover of the magazine, and they make it look as if it happened overnight. Again, because we praise the speed, we want to show how it really took no time to get there, but that's not the whole story. You talk about boredom, being bored, and you say how it's a modern invention. And speaking of fears, it's one of the things people fear. I don't want to be bored. So we fill up our days with anything we can. 
even people that work part time or they're retired or they're financially independent, one of the biggest fears they have is what am I going to do with all this time?、Mm -hmm. And can you talk about that? Why do we need to fill up the day with all the activities? Yeah, I think there are two reasons. One is just the cultural pressure and imperative to be busy. Yeah. So、mm -hmm. in our culture, busy is a badge of honor. It's held up as a good in itself, an end in itself. You know, it's even part of our, you know, The vernacular of every day. You meet someone in the street. You say, "How are you doing?" They say, "Busy." You know, they don't even tell you how they're just busy. And if you're not busy, it's like, "Oh, he's not busy, or she's not busy. Things can't be going that well." You know, there's a sort of assumption that busy is synonymous with with success and triumph and happiness. When in fact, very often it's it's the enemy of all those things. Right? Too much busyness just erodes the quality of work we do, the quality of life we have, the way we enjoy our moments. So, of course, that is one of the pressures that means us. We're afraid of. Not being busy or not of getting bored, but there's something else which is deeper and more metaphysical at play here. And I think that a big part of the speed culture is, at some level, a mechanism de of denial. So being very busy, very distracted, very fast, very impatient is a way of running away from ourselves. It's a way of running away from the deeper questions in life, such as, you know, who am I? What's what is my purpose here? Am I living the right life for me? Are, are, are my family well? My community well? All these big, big, epic questions that we need to be asking. I mean, Socrates talked about the importance of the examined life and so on. You got no time to examine your life or grapple with big questions when you're juggling fifteen things in a twenty-nine hour day. It just it doesn't happen. So I think for a lot of people, the fear of boredom is the fear of confronting yourself and the fact that the life you're living may not be the right life for you. That's a that's kind of be a frightening prospect. It's easier to grapple with the small questions like. Where are my keys? I'm late for my 11 a.m. <laughs> or <laughs> no, where's my phone charger? <laughs> like all these sort of little things that just distract us and keep us going, or or just to you know start scrolling through social media or just any little thing to stop us to to distract us from ourselves. I think ultimately, which is why therapists often describe the last stage before burnout as as one final burst of acceleration. So it's like the person is desperately trying to outrun all of those problems that they've been pushing to the side and、right. covering up with busyness. They're trying to outrun them and then crash into the wall. They hit、mm -hmm. or have the burnout. And the interesting thing is that pretty much by and large, I would say most people don't have two burnouts. You know, once you've had a full-on real burnout, you know, you are then forced to confront yourself to wrestle with your inner demons, to grapple with those big questions. And when you do, you may go back to a life that was similar to what you had before, very similar even. It could be the same career, but you're going to go back with a different spirit. I guarantee you're going to go back with a slow spirit. You're going to go back. Not trying to outrun yourself and and run away from life, you're going to try, on the contrary, to slow down and walk towards life. I love and that and yourself, right? Because ultimately, that's I mean, how, how, I mean, that just seems to me when you talk about how what is a life well lived? A life well lived is being in touch with yourself, right? Knowing knowing who you are and being comfortable with yourself. I think so many of the world's problems come from the fact that we find it really hard just to sit alone with ourselves in a room and do nothing. <laughs> So, so how was boredom invented? It looks like boredom is yet another, you know, fear mongering tactic. If tactic, if nothing is happening, you're going to be bored. And you mentioned it's a it's a modern invention. And we're living in a world where there's no shortage of stimulation and entertainment. You have it in in your hand all day long. Why fear boredom? Like why fear that time when nothing is happening? You have nothing scheduled. Why fear that time? Well, I think for that very reason, because th that time, precious as it is, and essential as it is to To live a real life, that time means doing doing the existential, metaphysical homework、mm -hmm. that you've been putting off, right? The kind of looking into yourself and saying, "It catches up with you." Yeah, all of that stuff. I think that's why we run away from it, and it's a modern invention because the modern world is predicated on consumption and entertainment. For most of human history, there was really not much to distract you. <laughs> you know, you know,、mm -hmm. you were working in the fields. You, know,、uh, you, know, you there was just not much. There was not much to look at. Mm -hmm. There was very little art.、Uh, there was music. People made music. I mean, it was just so little compared to what we had. So people would have just by dint of the, the the world they were in would have had loads of time when there was just no external or very little external stimulation. So they would have had time to, or they would have just got, they would have made their peace with boredom. Let's put it that way. Whereas you get into the modern era, which is an era of restlessness and novelty and consuming the next thing coming down the pike, and that's a world where. Our lizard brains, right? We're always looking for that next injection of dopamine, that、mm -hmm. next、um, exciting rush of adrenaline. You know, we're hardwired to look for that. That collides with consumer capitalist world, 
which needs people to go on consuming more and more things. <laughs> um, and so you put those two things together in the 19th century, and that's pretty much when boredom was invented as a concept. And the word entered, I think, the English, English language around that time. We've been on an upward curve for nearly two centuries since then, refining that model, mm -hmm. a model that abhors boredom, that leaves no room for it, that denigrates yeah. it, makes it seem like a form of failure. And we've also at the same time created a world that makes it so tempting and so easy to run away from boredom and by extension, run away from ourselves. So that's where we are today. Wow. Yeah, I, I love that. You write about being time rich and being time poor. And I thought it adds a whole dimension. So people look at their net worth, people look at their salaries, people look at the lifestyle they can afford. But putting all that aside, you talk about the other experience, which is, do you actually have time? And so many people are very successful, but they don't really have the time to enjoy whatever success mm. they have. Can you talk about that? I, this is really eye-opening, yeah. being time rich in this world where we all seem to be really time poor. Well, it, it reminds me of an old phrase, which I think goes back to the colonial era in Africa when local people in, in, in that continent, I mean, this, yeah, this would say to colonial, say, one of the things they used to say was, you have the clocks we have the time. And I think that they were saying that hundreds of years ago, but that's even more so today, right? Because we are measuring out our lives in five minute, you know, 10 second chunks. And every little sliver of time, we feel we have to use it up. We feel we have to fill it up with some productive or entertaining <clears throat> or, or some activity that involves performance on social media. There's just there's this pressure to be using time all, all the time. And in fact, that's the, the paradox is that that's the worst way to approach time. <laughs> I mean, I mean, in a way, the, of course, the other great expression about time is time is money, right? You know, the, the, which sounds so modern. It sounds like it was coined three years ago, but it's actually from Benjamin Franklin, 250 years ago. <laughs> and it, it kind of defines the modern era, that idea that time is money and time is therefore valuable. And how do you get the most value for your time? Well, in the modern world, you speed up. You do more and more with less and less time. But I think the more we think about it, The more we open our eyes to the way the world is, the more we realize that that is a false economy, right? That's a, that's a red herring because that's not the way to use time. The, the way to use time is to, is to be present with things you do, to do fewer things and to do those things well, to give to each thing you do the time and attention it deserves, right? And then once you arrive at your life thinking, that's how I'm going to arrange my day, my week, my year, my decade, then everything change, everything falls into place. You think, okay, then I'll, I won't be doing this, but I'll be doing that. And I'll be doing that better and enjoying it more and so on. So it's about kind of whatever you do, give that thing the time and attention it deserves. And if that means doing fewer things, so be it, right? You can only do so much. I mean, this is one of the chronic failings of the 21st century is that we are always trying to do way too much stuff and we end up doing <laughs> it badly, not enjoying it and not having even those little, we've even removed those interstitial moments, the, the, the moments between doing stuff. So, that, yeah. you know, if you, if you watch a, series on Netflix, the moment the first credit runs, Netflix is queuing up the next episode for you, right? you. You've got not even 10 seconds to process or digest or metabolize what you've just experienced, or even to get up and go to the bathroom right? or make a cup of tea. They're throwing you into the next thing. And I think that's a, a useful metaphor for the way we live our lives now is we're just ramming everything in so that A, the things we do, we do them too fast. And B, we don't even have those little in-between moments, which are so important for making sense of what you've just been through, what it meant, uh, what you're taking away from it before you go to the next thing. We're just kind of racing through in a blur from one thing to the next. And so what my, the book, book is called In Praise of Slow in, in, uh, in much of the world. And I often think it could be called In Praise of No, because right. <laughs> this, you know, this a first step towards embracing the slow creed and, and a life worthy of the name is saying no to things, is prioritizing, is just doing less so you can do those things better. In fact, you know, here's one from the investment world. There's a, one of my favorite quotes is from Warren Buffett, right? The legendary uh -huh. investor who said once, mm -hmm. the difference between successful people and very successful people is very successful people say no to almost everything. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's just a wonderful way of, of framing slow. It's kind of saying, okay, life is this infinite smorgasbord of things yes. to do, consume, mm -hmm. buy, work on, experience, collect. You cannot have it all. Just think of what a, what a buffet is, like a, a smorgasbord. You turn up, and if you pile your plate with too many things, you go back to your your table, everything mushes together. You don't really enjoy the, you know, and then you go up and get another plate and then you feel unwell because you've eaten too much. You know, far better to slow down, 
look at what's on the table and pick two or three things. Go back and really take the time to enjoy those, savor them. And then maybe if you're still hungry, go back and choose a couple more (laughs) rather than trying to ram 15 things onto your plate and wolf them all down before you get up again in five minutes to fill your plate up. And, you know, that's a a food metaphor, but, you know, Warren Buffett tells us it's the same thing in the investment world, right? Less is more, slower is often better. Choices seem unlimited and overwhelming because you can really do anything, pick up anything. And eventually you have to realize it's important to choose where to spend your time and how you spend your time. You mm-hmm. mentioned time and money. And I was thinking somebody pointed it out in a conversation not long ago to me that you can borrow money, but you can't borrow time. And yeah. I really thought about it for a second, right? There might be a time when you need extra money. You don't have it. You go to a bank or you borrow it. They actually make it pretty easy these days. You don't have to see anybody. <laughs> but exactly. you, 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 <laughs> you can't borrow time. And you say, I really need an extra hour. And the day is over. It's midnight, right? You can't get an extra hour. Whatever you've done today, you have the same 24 hours than anybody else, from Warren Buffett exactly. all the way to, to us, to anybody. So I think that's really interesting when people yeah. think we, we trade time for money. That's true. But yeah. Think about it's it. It's a that. false transaction. It's a transaction that can never occur. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a mirage. And, and it's also the same when people say, people talk about saving time. And I was saying, mm-hmm. well, what does that even mean? I mean, you can't save up an hour for later. You, you have the it's hour here now. It's just this hour. <laughs> you know, you've got this moment here now. You'll never have this mm-hmm. moment again. Why spoil it by trying to be in several other moments at the same time or by trying to squish way too much into this moment? Why not just light this moment up by being fully present in it and mm-hmm. picking the one thing that fits in this moment and giving everything you've got to that thing or that task or that moment? I mean, that's that's the way you get through life with a smile on your face and a spring in your step, not running around trying to save money or sort of save time up for late because it just that's not time is too slippery for that. Time's too clever. It's too you can't bo- yeah, you can't borrow it and you can't save it. We think about time the same as we think about money too much. And it's a very different concept. Yeah. Um, and could I just, I, I just, I'll just, go ahead. if you don't mind, mm-hmm. I just want to circle back to that time rich, time poor thing. I, I tend not to use those expressions because it suggests that some people have more time than others. When in fact, as you just said, we all have the same 24 hours in the day. Nobody is more time rich or time poor than anyone else. It comes down to how we use the time. <laughs> Choice, choices. And, and yes. some people use some people use the time wisely. Those are the people who slow down. Mm-hmm. The people who never slow down are the people who are misusing time. Well, it's interesting because uh, to me personally, the COVID pandemic experience was an opportunity to rethink a lot of aspects of my life and work. But one of the things I noticed in March of 2020 is that my calendar got cleared. All the commitments, all the things I said yes to for the next few months they went away. All the in-person conferences I was supposed to speak in different places, all of those things went away. And all the commitments I had in person in New York City, they went away. And suddenly this huge void was, vacuum was created in my calendar. And I thought, I have a second chance to decide how I'm going to spend the next few months. And I never had that experience before, that I could say no to all of those things. I didn't have to say no because I don't want to do them. I was allowed to say no because we were not allowed to do those things. We couldn't sit down and have lunch with somebody. We couldn't fly to a conference and talk to 200 people. It was an opportunity to really rethink, okay, what do I do with the next few months? And I think it was a a really eye-opening experience to me, and I'm sure a lot of people thought about it. I'm curious what your experience was, but a very very unique moment. It was, yeah. It was an extraordinary moment. It was hellish. It was dreadful in so many ways. But I, I think that that feeling of liberation and lightness that people felt when they looked at a calendar that would normally be rammed full of stuff and saw empty space, free space, I think felt like a like such a shot in the arm. <laughs> and, and I felt it as well. And I, I'm somebody who is not especially overscheduled. And I'm you know a big believer in the Warren Buffett idea of saying no and I, d- I don't feel ru- like I said earlier. I, you know, I, I've got a pretty good balance in my life, but of course, COVID really just obliterated everything. So I suddenly mm-hmm. found myself with much more empty time and and sca- you know empty days on my calendar. And at first, I, I got to be honest, I felt a little bit worried. I mean, I thought you know things that were that was work. These were work things, right? This is sort of income. It's all the things that are tied up with that. But I don't know. I kind of sat with it. I couldn't do anything about it, as you say, right? We just simply couldn't do it. And and over time, I began to feel not at all worried. Actually, the worry kind of went away and I began to think, well, look, this is just a different moment. 
Mm-hmm. I'm going to dedicate this time to different things. Uh, I found I found myself doing more slow things. Uh, began taking a very long walk every day. I mean, I'm a big walker. I move around a lot, do a lot of sports, but like actually going for a long hour, hour and a half walk and stuff. And I still sometimes, I don't do it every day now, but I still do it a couple of times a week. So, so I began adding more some slow things to my, and I began cooking, I, I would say more, which I've carried on since the pandemic. And what I've definitely since done since the pandemic has ended, well, hope, let's hope it's ended, right? Is I now, I used to spread things across my working week. Now I try to have at least two days when I have nothing in my calendar a week. Right. And, and those days when I arrive and I've, cause I've got work to do, right? I'm not, I might, I'll be reading or writing or stuff, but just to know that I get up in the morning and there is no expectation. I don't have to turn up anywhere for anyone apart from myself at my rhythm, at my groove, my speed on my time it just feels like, like manna from heaven. And, and so I've, I kind of try and keep usually either Tuesday on and th- well, it varies week to week, but usually two days a week. And I'm, and that's been a, that's, I think that's probably been my most useful like, practical shift since the pandemic is trying to keep two days a week when, and, and just kind of move everything else to the other three days that involves commitment. I think it's a very good practice. And I think it's a good transition to a question I had about remote work and your thoughts in general. Yeah. Do you think it has helped us slow down? You touched on it a little bit at the beginning once we um, started talking. It allowed us to reclaim a lot a lot of time that we're not commuting. I know it's not everybody, but when you think about the statistics, it's really? a, a lot of people. Even it's, those a lot that, of yeah. it's a lot of hours. It's a lot of hours. hours. Yes. And you can spend it differently. And and commuting, from what I read, read is was the most dreaded time of the day for most of the people. The source of stress, the source of dissatisfaction, you know, missed dinners with your spouses, missed uh, time with the kids, and all those things that we were giving up to be able to show up at a desk and really sit in front of a computer for the next, you know, eight, nine, 10, 12 like, hours. So <laughs> it's not like it's a social event for a lot of people. Yeah. Well, so, um, or, yeah. What do I say? Optimistic. My take on, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that remote working has been a, it's a mixed bag at the moment. Of course. I think the fact that it was forced upon us mm-hmm. is good because it, it, it shook things up. It, the tectonic plates moved and they'll not move back to what they were before. It forced us to try things we wouldn't have dreamed trying. And we've re- realized that things we thought we could never do, we can do. So mm-hmm. that's opened up a whole world of possibilities. I think we're in that first and second phase where we're trying to work out exactly how to make the most of it. And, and, and it's not, we're not there yet. Um, I mean, sure, there are a lot of benefits for some people, you know, not having to commute. Um, it, it, some companies have been open-minded and forward-looking and are giving their staff more control over their working hours so that they actually end up being more productive and happier and so on. That's all great, but that's not every company. Some companies are doubling down on, you know, controlling people and, and, you know, putting in surveillance software to measure their keystrokes and, you know, forcing them to spend even more time online than they would have in the past. So this is, we're not in the land of milk and honey here. You, no. Uh, but what has <laughs> happened is we've, we've been given a glimpse of, of a brave new world and that's powerful. I think we can now start having conversations and running pilot projects and testing out things that wouldn't have been conceivable or permissible five years ago. So that's great. I think it's going to take some time to shake out through the system so that each company and every sector can work out what the right recipe of remote working is for them. It's not going to be the same for everyone because every workplace is different. But I think we've opened the door to a new way of doing things. And I think that's great. It was a shock and it was done in a way that people associated with pandemic work from home model, which was you know very different because we had so much more on our minds that we would normally not think about just being afraid of leaving the house and all those concerns that people had at the time and combine it with working from home and combine it with the fact we couldn't see our families and friends for a long time. So I think yeah. people lumped it all into one. But then if you actually think about work, work from home or remote work as the fact that your work is what you do, not where you go and leave the pandemic baggage behind i think we can grow to appreciate the benefits of it but i think it also pushed that's a nice way that's a nice way to think about it i think yeah i think you're right right because i i talked to some remote work experts and they said well we haven't really tried the proper clean remote work we just did the pandemic experiment and now what people complain about has, has nothing to do with the actual just remote work concept but i like the idea that you mentioned it was forced on us and i think it's interesting with change in general you talked about burnout but here we reached a certain point and this remote work was forced on us i think if every company had to volunteer to switch to remote work over time we could have waited another 30 years before we yeah. tried it <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah right. which would be which would be that but bad slow right yeah, and slow. this is one of those things. I mean, human beings, we're, we, there's so much inertia, fear of change, confirmation bias, all these things that just keep us in a rut, even though we can feel that the rut is doing us full on harm. So every once in a while, you need it. 
deus ex machina, right? You need something to come from outside to just shake the whole system up. And that's where the pandemic, you know, when I talk about silver linings, I think that's a silver lining of the pandemic. It's, um, it made us see new, new possibilities and forced yeah. us to try them. Yeah, just try it and see if it works and then learn from it. You mentioned tech companies in your book. And these are the companies that in my mind allowed us to speed up, but they're the ones that are also curious about slowing down. This is And I thought this is interesting. A second thing that's interesting and has some something to do with what we just talked about is, to me, the companies that allowed us to work from home were the companies that hesitated to switch to remote work 100% after the pandemic was already you know, subsiding. And some of the big tech companies said, uh, we actually want to have people back in the office. And I was a little bit surprised because these are the companies that helped us work from home. And powered mm -hmm. us to work from home. So can you talk about this contradiction? They are giving the speed, but they want to slow down. And then the fact that... Yeah. Well, I, I guess the um, in, in the same way that remote work is is a spectrum, uh, just in the same way as fast and slow, there's a spectrum of choosing the right speed and so on. There's choosing the right balance. And you know there is a lot to be said for being in the office together, for creative collisions and serendipitous meetings and people overhearing stuff and mentorship. And there's so many things to be gained from being in the same human beings, being the same place. We are creatures of the tactile world. So I, I, I think it's not going to be the majority of companies where everybody's working remotely all the time. That's just, I mean, some that could work, but I think you're going to want to have some kind of mix. So in a way, it, it seems like a contradiction that the companies that gave us the tools to work remotely are saying to the staff, we don't want you to work remotely all the time. <laughs> That's, I would say it's a contradiction only on the face of it. It makes to me it makes sense that they would want them in the office some of the time. Right. I guess I would say that the, 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 Twitter is the standout example, right? With Elon Musk, he, yes. I think he's demanded mm -hmm. everyone be in the office all the time. Mm -hmm. I think that's probably wrong, and that's just Elon Musk doing his Elon Musk thing of you know, <laughs> yeah. Well, that's a whole other podcast, right? Yes. But I, I think that most sensible, well, not just tech companies, but companies in every sector will eventually settle on some kind of hybrid arrangement. Yeah. And that's, that's, that's going to take time because there will be some trial and error and some experimenting and so on. But I think, I think we will get there. You're also interested in aging. And in the book about slowness, you mentioned that the demographics are actually working in our favor in the sense that we will be getting older and we will be slowing down. Can you talk about the transition between the topics and then how you got interested in aging and you wrote another book about how to age better, how to feel better about aging? Uh, well, I, I got into that as, as uh, we're coming full circle here. I, I had another existential crisis, mm. which was that I was playing in a hockey tournament and um, you know playing really well. And I, I scored an incredible highlight reel goal that propelled my team into the semifinals and I was walking on air. And then one of the tournament organizers came up to me and said, uh, that was a great goal. Well done. Um, by the way, I've just been looking at player profiles and you're the oldest player here. And it was funny because I knew I was one of the oldest, right? I'm not deluded, but suddenly being the oldest, just, I don't know, it just totally rocked me. I just, suddenly I went from goal scorer to granddad and I felt like I shouldn't be there and all these questions crowded in, like, you know, people laughing at me. Do I look out of place here? Should I take up a more age appropriate pasta? Like bingo, maybe. And it was just, I don't know, I just thought, why has my age suddenly taken on this terrible power to define and limit me? And I, I came away from that tournament thinking, something's not right here. I need to understand why I'm so appalled by the idea of growing older, which is the most natural thing. We're all doing it. Why am I letting this hold me back, my chronological age? So that was sort of the starting point for writing my book, Boulder. The link with slow is that, I, actually, when I first began working on the subject, I didn't really think of it as being linked to slow. But of course, one of the things that happens as you get older is that you generally, physically, we do tend to slow down. We don't have the same, I mean, even elite athletes don't have the same explosive speed and power at 40 as they did at 20. That's just the way it is, right? So you are slowing down in that in, on the physical side. You may not be slowing down on the, the mental cognitive side. You, you may actually be able to solve problems faster because of the onboard database of experience and know-how that you've been expertise you've built up over the years. So you, you may get quicker um, cognitively, but physically you're going to slow down. And, and in a world that prizes speed, that slowing down physically can make you feel bad about aging. You think, oh God, I'm ashamed. I'm not as fast in some ways as I was before. So I guess with the new book, Boulder, I'm tack like with the, with the earlier work, I'm taking on the cult of speed. With the new work, I'm taking on the cult of youth. <laughs> and of course, youth, youth and speed are, are intertwined. They're often two sides of the same coin in people's minds. So they, they, they overlap those two cults. Uh, and, and when you think about slowing down as a benefit, in the whole slow movement and so on. I think it's the same thing with aging. If you think that some of the slowing down that happens as we grow older is actually not that bad a thing. I mean, one of the things we get better at as we get older is we get better at being present and in the moment, which is kind of a very good slow thing. Uh, we get better at prioritizing. 
Uh, we also get better, our social skills improve, our social acumen sharpens, which means we forge deeper relationships. We get more pleasure from the moment and from other people. All really good stuff and good, useful stuff in the workplace as well. So in a way, I guess the new book, Boulder, kind of without saying it, it a lot and explicitly is kind of picking up some of those slow themes. There's, there's some definitely some threads running through my work that tie to slow, I guess, in, in, in lots of ways. Well, I'm thinking of the other book that you wrote earlier that talks about probably the busiest demographic, and I'm thinking of kids. Right. <laughs> yeah. When when I hear about parents and kids and how they book their kids in so many activities, I thought that I was busy as a kid, but kids today, I think it's a whole new level. It's just, I mean, kids now, it's they just come out of the womb and they hit the ground running, right? You know, it's baby Einstein DVDs, baby sign language classes, baby goes pro sports clip. Mandarin lessons in the Moses basket and it's endless extracurricular. I mean, childhood for a lot of kids now has become a rat race. It's become a race to perfection. And it wasn't like that through most of human history. Yeah. I mean, it certainly wasn't like that when I was growing up in the 70s and well, the 80s really. And it wasn't like that through most of the 90s. But this shift in parenting and child rearing occurred in the last 20 years or so. And now we're bringing the same high speed, high stakes, high competition, high pressure ethos that we have in our adult lives. We're transmitting that to our kids. And it doesn't work because kids need slowness. <laughs> they're, they are the champions of slow. You think of a child, most kids don't even understand how to tell time till they're five no. or six, right? They just don't, they don't, they think you say, hurry up. And they say, what, what, why? What's, you know, I'm doing this thing here. What, what is, what is this thing about? We got to save time. That's just totally, yet we inculcate all of that anxiety about time and all that rushing and impatience in them from right at the start. And yeah, to my second book, Under Pressure, was all about mm. questioning that and trying to come up with a blueprint for raising children in a fast world, you know, helping them find that balance between fast and slow and busyness and boredom and getting finding that sweet spot so that kids can, can thrive. Maybe we can learn from the kids how to slow down. And I'm going to include it. I'm going to include all the books in the notes. I know we're at our time, but do you have one more minute for one more question? Sure. Definitely. I'm curious about your definition of success. I like to ask my guests. Mm -hmm. They have all oh. kinds of pursuits and careers. And uh, I'm curious, how do you define your success? Is it a for journey, me, a destination? And how yeah, do you think no, about it? For me, success is easy to define. I define it as that feeling of waking up in the morning and thinking to yourself, yes, another day. <laughs> really simple. If you're, if you're waking up every morning thinking, another day, I'm ready to spring out of bed and take this day by the scruff of the neck, I'm looking forward to it. That is success in my book with a capital S. I love it. Well, I think it's the best place to end. Thank you, Carl. This was a, a remarkable conversation. I think uh, your book, this conversation, gave me permission to slow down and think about time in a different way. And uh, I hope the audience will pause for a second and think about how they spend their time and how they can't borrow it. And maybe there's no time saving. Uh, all you have is the hour of the day in front of you. So thank you so much. Thank you very much. Can I just finish with one final quote? Tell Another me, favorite please. of mine is yes. from Mae West, the famous actress who once said, anything worth doing is worth doing slowly. I love it. Let's do it slowly. <laughs> <laughs> you were listening to Talking Billions. We talk about big ideas, big inspirations, big topics. We take on the hardest subject of all, money. But our conversations lead us to an even bigger question, what it means to live a rich life beyond money. If you enjoyed the show, Please take a moment and follow, subscribe, rate, and share with friends and family. We rely on word of mouth to promote the show. One click for you means the world to us. Thank you. Until next time, your host, Bogomil Baranowski. The content of this podcast is for general informational purposes only, and so are the opinions of members of Seacard Associates, a registered investment advisor, and guests of the show. This podcast does not constitute a recommendation to buy or sell any specific security or financial instruments or provide investment advice or service. Past performance is not indicative of future results. More information on Seacard Associates is available in its Form ADV disclosure documents available at advisorinfo.sec.gov.